It's a mean age. But it is going to be a beautiful future as long as we don't fuck it up. I'm Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, where I bring you unfiltered comedy, criticism, philosophy, and politics with a Mean Age Daydream. Yo, what's the good word? Pleasure bots out there in the world. This is Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, coming here to pleasure your ear holes as I lie there taking it like a rubberly fool. Welcome to today's show. I want to, first off, begin the show by making it very clear. There is an upstart organization, you may have heard of them, called the Lions of Liberty out in Arizona. Now, I don't know if Mark Claire is to blame for this group. My secret belief is that he left the Lions of Liberty to uh, to create the Mark Claire show, but really has left to create this upstart organization of what looked like frumpy paintball players in Arizona, whose goal, stated goal anyway, is to ballot watch to make sure there's no election fraud in Arizona. Now, look, if you want to make sure the elections are secure, fine. It is a little bit creepy to sit around and watch people at the ballot boxes and all this other stuff. At the same time, I don't know. Is it a problem if people want to watch to make sure people aren't messing with ballot boxes? Probably not. Of course, it also raises the question of if someone's more likely to screw with a ballot box, is it the people that are sitting there 24-7 around the clock watching it? Or is it whoever is going to mess with the box? You know, just... Occam's razor here, guys. If I was going to guess somebody was going to mess with the ballot boxes, it would probably be the people that are sticking around at four in the morning with those boxes. But I digress. There is this new Lions of Liberty that has popped up and uh, they will be here and gone. Like I said, they're here just, I believe, to ballot box the midterm elections in Arizona and they will soon be gone by the wayside. John and I had a conversation. Okay, dude, what do we want to do? Do we want to try to serve them a cease and desist letter, you know, all this all this stuff about whether what to do about it. I think it's just going to resolve itself. And in the meantime, if you are here because you heard of this group in Arizona, well, welcome. You found yourself a better thing to listen to, a better thing to believe in. And really, <laughs> I think it'll just go away on its own. If it doesn't, of course, then I can call Jason Stapleton, my good buddy over there who has uh, the wonderful Jason Stapleton show, by the way. Check that out. Uh, he's going to be doing a really awesome entrepreneur event coming up, by the way. I'm going to tell you more about that next week. But Jason Stapleton, good friend of mine. Of course, Jason Stapleton, entrepreneur, former Army, uh, former Marine, sorry, not Army, former Marine and Special Recons. Jason was a sniper. So, you know, he's an entrepreneur. We got this problem with guys in Arizona. They just happen to be sitting around ballot boxes at 3, 4 a.m. You know, no one's really around. Eh, you know, I'm not saying Jason's going to kill these people for us, but maybe he's open to a conversation. Who's going to know? <laughs> he could shoot them from a mile away. We'll see how it shakes out. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. But it does reinforce the importance of branding because at first... When this story came out, a, a bunch of yahoos were like, you know, tweeting at us at Lions of Liberty, which of course you guys should follow us on Twitter at Lions of Liberty. We have the moniker. People are tweeting like, I can't believe you sons of bitches, you know, and we have people like from the Arizona public, like, you know, CCing us or not CCing, but including us as their, you know, this, these are the people, which I very plainly stated, Hey, you got the wrong guy, doof. Go the way, you know, look at the podcast. L just look at the Twitter profile very clearly is not the same thing. That has come to benefit us. Now, I've had only one media request come in by email and also on our Instagram from a French reporter, made a mistake, thought, oh, I, I thought you were the same organization. She apologized. Oh, I'm sorry, you must be getting a ton of these. But you know what? We have it. That's the thing. We have it. Now, number one, I did put a note up on our Twitter saying, hey, we're not that organization. We're vastly better looking and have been around vastly longer time with a different mission. But we haven't gotten that many inquiries in, nor have we been tagged on Twitter, which you'd think would happen all the time. Just by virtue of people just thinking, oh, it's probably just at Lions of Liberty, that account exists, I'll see them. But that's the importance of branding, guys. Lions of Liberty has powerful branding that's been around. If you look at it, it says distinctly who we are, what we believe in, what we bring to the table, what we've been doing. So that way, people are not instantly just going to say, ah, these are those guys. It's so simple to find out who we're not. 
and who we are that we have not had the influx, as you would think, of hate and spam and all this other stuff, which is great because honestly, my concern wasn't that I had to clarify this to people coming in. And as I said, from my public relations standpoint, which is my day job, for those of you who don't know, I do public relations for almost 20 years now. My day job is to create brands. It is to get uh, public notice out there about companies, about people, about you know, whatever's, whoever's doing something interesting in whatever space. And even when they're not doing something interesting, that's my job, is to get them attention for it. And there is the old adage, any press is good press. Ipso facto, ipso facto, ipso facto, um, the reason why John and I have not fought tooth and nail to try to shut these guys down or say, hey, knock it off. You know, you're using a name that's already taken because the attention it will bring with our branding isn't a problem, namely because people can instantly see we're not those guys, but it's probably bringing a lot of eyeballs our way. So it's a win win for us. Maybe it's a win-win for Arizona. I don't know. It might be a win-lose. <laughs> if these, if, if I end up stapletoning these people, it's a lose-lose for them. But point being, if you guys are out there, if you have a podcast, if you have a, you know, anything you're trying to brand, if you're trying to message out there, make sure you get it right. Make sure you spend the time, spend the effort to get the branding correct, to tell them exactly what you're doing in a succinct manner to avoid any mishaps and get people on your side. Bam, that's it. Well, I'm talking about us. Guys, check out this t-shirt. Wax on, tax off with Mr. Miyagi. What's not to love? You can go and get yourself a t-shirt at lionsofliberty.store. We've got many designs, a lot of fun. We've got this one. We've got uh, taxation is death. Got a lot of other stuff too. Just our old logos, which by the way, we'll still have them up there. We're going to phase them out. I think you can even still get some Mark Claire stuff up there, which is pretty funny. So if you want to get some Mark Claire stuff to troll him, if you're going to be seeing him at any point in time, now's the time to do it. Lionsofliberty.store. And if you don't like buying t-shirts, if you only want to spend $5 to get bonus content, go to patreon.com forward slash lions of liberty or lions of liberty dot locals dot com. We have the most bonus content. You're not going to find it anywhere else than any other podcast out there. I promise you do uh, doing degenerate gamblers. We're doing, uh, of course, Do Nothing Man is going to be coming out tomorrow. So make sure if you want to get in here that it's coming out tomorrow. The brand new Do Nothing Man versus the Military Industrial Complex. So that'll be a fun time. Don't forget, we also do our secrets, lies, and cover-ups, live streams. I'm going to be doing a live stream of the Halloween show. Monday on Halloween, the uh, Mean Age Daydream Halloween Spooktacular. That is going to be at... 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific on Halloween day. So make sure to tune in for that. Good times had by all. Support the show, subscribe, and help us out on Patreon because that's going to help us do upgrades to everything we're doing here. And we have a lot of big plans for Lions of Liberty, guys. So stay tuned. Okay, hopping into it. Now, I want to talk about the CDC and how they have made... I mean. First off, they've enraged a nation of parents, right? The CDC decision has enraged a nation of parents. But like I said, in the title of this, this thing is going to have wide ripples in the political sphere with the midterms coming up. I'm going to get to that in just a bit because I saw something today that really intrigued me. And it's just that Marlon Wayans, now Marlon Wayans is the skinny Wayans brother, right? There's Marlon Wayans, there's Damon Wayans, who of course hilariously played Handyman and Homie the Clown and other, other classic characters. There is, uh, oh God, what's the older Wayans that was in? I'm going to get you sucker that was so funny. Uh, Keenan Keen Ivory Wayans, of course, in Living Color. They all were on in Living Color. It's kind of how they got their start. In Living Color, which by the way, hilarious show, primarily black cast. Jim Carrey got his start on that show, but they really did some funny, funny sketches, not only taking on some race stuff, but just making fun of whatever they wanted to. And that ties into what Marlon Wayans is quoted on. I guess he did an interview with BuzzFeed, and I'm not sure exactly what prompted it, because I'm seeing all these other people pick up on the quote. But he went out of his way to talk about white chicks. Now, I'm not talking about the chicks that are white that everybody sees out of Lake Havasu Flash and their tots. I'm talking about the movie White Chicks, which I will admit I have never seen. Shame on me. I know I should have seen it. I, it's one of those things where if it was on and it was just a, on HBO and I saw it flip it through, I would have watched it. But it, for some reason in my history, I have not, even though it seems like a concept I would enjoy. The base premise of White Chicks is that two black brothers and it's Marlon Wayans and I cannot remember his brother's name. They get two, they're both in Scary Movie, though, the better looking one. 
they are pretending to be white chicks. And I think it's for some collegiate reason. I guess it's kind of like a, an inverted soul man, which is, which is a movie we've talked about on my comedy podcast, the boring podcast, B O H R I N G, uh, at ad nauseum, because that features a white guy, C Thomas Howell pretending to be black to get into college and, uh, has James Earl Jones in it. So it can't be all bad. I think this is a flip on that point being, it's still black dudes pretending to be white women. Now, in today's day and age, could this film be made? Kind of like what I was talking about, Blazing Saddles, could it be made? I would still argue yes. I would argue because, you know, you can really make fun of white people as much as you want. There's no line you can't cross when you're making fun of white people, threatening white people, whatever it comes down to. There's no line you are not permitted to cross. However, oh, unless that white person's Jewish, then you can't cross it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that because Jewish because Jewish people aren't white apparently. That's what I've been told. So Marley Wayans is out there saying that you know cancel culture is evil, and I'll bring up the exact quote. Now I agree with him and everything he's saying. By the way, I'm just pointing out that I think this would still be made today. But he said that in a recent BuzzFeed uh, interview, white chicks are important. Movies like White Chicks are important in a current climate of cancel culture and censorship. I think they're needed, Wayans said. I don't know what planet we're on where you think people don't need laughter and that people need to be censored or canceled. If a joke is going to get me canceled, thank you for doing me that favor. Oh, Sean Wayans. That's the other Wayans brother. Um, it's sad that society is a place where we can't laugh anymore, he said. I, am, I ain't listening to this damn generation. Good for you. I ain't listening to these folks, these scared-ass people, these scared executives. Y'all do what you want to do. Great. I'm still going to tell my jokes the way I tell them good on him and he says his fans obviously have no problem with his style of comedy also marlon wayans is 50. 50 what jesus christ i guess you know, i guess I'll, seven years i'll be 50. and <laughs> and uh oh okay i i was giving you a different description of the movie by the way this is this is the description they give on the fox news article i'm reading white chicks is a comedy film starring wayans as his and his brother sean wayans as fbi agents ah they're fbi agents who go undercover as two stereotypical blonde-haired white women by using whiteface to solve a kidnapping plot i like that they call it whiteface the movie was made with 37 million and grossed more than 113 million at the box office there you go so good yeah hey, the movies are are important like this you need to be you need to be able to create content that is considered not only as potentially offensive, but more than likely offensive because it doesn't matter until it gets out there in the public, you really don't know the response to it, right? And I like that Merlon Wayans is saying this generation sucks, which they do, and saying that he doesn't believe in cancel culture nor censorship. Now, do I wish he'd been saying this years ago? Of course, of course I do. And that's where a little bit the ulterior motives come in and you wonder, okay, is Marlon Wayans simply saying this because he now knows that he's kind of a fading star. You know, he hasn't really done anything big in a while. He and his brother did Scary Movie and Scary Movie 2, which, by the way, hilarious fucking movies. Unbelievably funny. Scary Movie 2 is one of my favorite, favorite horror comedies, favorite comedies in general, not only featuring the making fun of all stereotypes, white stereotypes, college kids, sexy stereotypes, black stereotypes. They're, they turn like a gay stereotype on its head. His brother, Sean, plays like this you know, kind of butch football guy that's also super gay, always trying to suck in everybody's dick. You've got David Cross in it, right? David Cross, who's ultra super left. And yes, I do think David Cross was on Tucker Carlson trolling him, by the way. <laughs> in a recent interview, I don't have the clip handy, but it's a guy that went on to talk about, I think, again, election integrity, and definitely is David Cross. This definitely is David Cross doing, I guess, a straight man uh, satire. But the scary movie, David Cross plays a handicapped guy in a wheelchair that refuses to ever take help from anybody else and has a this, this absolutely hilarious dialogue back and forth with um, Chris, uh, the guy, God, I can't remember what his last name is, the guy from Something About Mary that was his best buddy, uh, Chris something or other, who plays another handicapped guy who's a butler with a little mutant hand. And they just go back and forth riffing on each other because each one thinks the other one is more handicapped and more worthy of pity than the former. It's a great movie. And like I said, it really, you wonder if that movie could be made today and probably couldn't. Because it is quote unquote offensive. It is quote unquote triggering. It is quote unquote ableist to make all these mockeries of different people with different ailments and whatever it is in the world. Whatever. What fucking ever. 
But I do wonder if he's out there saying this because he wants to get white chicks remade. Wouldn't surprise me or just wants to make himself relevant again. Either way, I don't care. I'm glad he said it. Now, what intrigued me even further, though, because you'd think a black comedian coming out like this, talking about this film, which people really did enjoy, would just be like, okay, great. Okay, we agree. And you'd see you know, you'd see idiots on the ultra left, of course, saying, well, you can't do that. It's still blah, 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 blah. But this one was interesting. This guy, Meech D. Lioncourt, and he's got like 30,000 followers. He's a black dude on Twitter. And I guess a writer of some sort. No, I don't really know. But he tweets out, in response to this Marlon Wayans thing about, no, he doesn't care about it. He says, first of all, White Chicks was and is still very funny. Everybody worried about cancel culture isn't making funny stuff. It's just offensive. There's a difference. Now, you can understand why I would have an issue with this. And I told him explicitly, I didn't call him stupid, but I did point out the fact that comedy... And what is or is not found offensive is subjective. Very subjective, in fact. I would say comedy and offensiveness is probably the most subjective thing we have. Literally, name me something more. Maybe Name me anything that's more subjective than what you find funny or what you find offensive. Because they're tied into each other, number one, number two. That's also tied into sexuality. It's tied into culture. It's tied into religion. These are very subjective things. And for this dumbass to say that, well, that's the difference. So don't you guys see the people that are making things now that are worried and, and saying that cancel culture is a problem. Well, they're just, it's just because they're not making funny things. What a fucking jackass. What a jackass that guy is. Yeah, man, that's what it is. They're just intentionally going out of their way to offend you. They're not trying to be funny at all. When they're creating these comedies, when they're creating their sense of humor, they're not trying to be funny. They're just trying to be offensive. And you're right, that's the difference. That's the difference, man. You nailed it. If we could just get people to start being funny again, we don't have to worry about cancel culture anymore. But that's the kind of hot take you're getting from people. That's the kind of reaction you get from people that have been so brainwashed by culture today to be offended that they don't understand that they're one in the same. Comedy and offensiveness, they're one in the same. It just depends on where you are in the spectrum. Just like autism, where are you on the spectrum? That's going to depend how strongly you react to certain stimuli. If you're really easily offended, you don't think shit's funny. If you're not, you probably find most things in life hilarious. And I guarantee I know which one of them is more happy. Guarantee which one of them has a better social life, more friends, better relationships with their families, better self-esteem, and tends to be a joyous person. And it's not the person who's more easily offended. But here we are. <laughs> All right, moving on. Let's take a little sip of this, a little sip of this whiskey here. I need a liquor sponsor. I was talking to Robbie. Robbie the Fire and I, I think we're going to do another Hate Watch, by the way. Uh, record Sunday night. We live stream that on Robbie's Twitter. I will, uh, of course, retweet it on my Twitter. But we watched uh, Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton do their terrible, terrible show, Gutsy. It's a it's a laugh riot. So make sure to tune in for that. Also, uh, don't forget Odie and I, John Odermatt, of course, host of Finding Freedom. He and I have a new show. We'll be doing it again, I believe, this Friday. We're going to try to do it every Friday. We're going to live stream it to Twitter. And that is our meme war, where we'll each choose two memes that we see over the course of the week, bring them to the table, and battle it out. And maybe we'll have a special guest here and there. We'll have to figure this out. We, you know, we've done one show so far. Those of you who are subscribed to the Lions of Liberty Network feed have probably heard it. But it is meme wars. It is our Friday show. And it is a good time. And while we're talking about different channels, don't forget, guys, please do subscribe to the Mean Age Daydream solo feed, as well as the Lions of Liberty Network. Uh, Finding Freedom has its own feed as well. I will be doing more content just for that feed. As I said, I've done some bonus shows here and there. I'm going to be doing more of that. I'm actually putting right together a, a panel, like a drinking panel show. I think I'm going to hit up the guys at Punk Rock a Libertarians for that. Um, they don't know it yet, though, so it'll be a surprise. But... 
Mean Age Daydream solo feed. Please subscribe. Please give us a five-star ranking. And just in general, guys, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, which, yes, still shadow banned to hell, but we've got the Mean Age Daydream YouTube solo channel. Subscribe to that so we can try to get the super shows going. Um, please give a review. Please subscribe to all the things that you have heard about. And share the show. Share the show. Okay, next thing I want to talk about. So the CDC has really stuck it up Dems asses. And <laughs> you would not think that the CDC recommending a vaccine should be a one-way political issue. But if you've been paying attention to everyone that's been calling for Mac mandated vaccines, for people to be fired, for people to be um, barred from entering public buildings, uh, movie theaters for people that have been for lockdowns. All of these people had one thing in common, predominantly, not to say that the Republicans are off the hook on this. Of course, Donald Trump was the one that instituted these uh, this fast vaccine process to begin with and also permitted the country to be locked down. But more often than not, the people that kept lockdowns that pushed these vaccine mandates through, they were on the Democratic side of the spectrum. The more left you were, the more you were for the vaccines. Just so happens that the vaccines may or may not do what they're supposed to. I'm going to leave it at that because I don't feel like having our YouTube channels taken down and demonetized again after we just got them back. But wink, wink, you know what I mean. It's fascinating that the CDC, this advisory board, has voted 15 to 0, despite thousands of comments saying that the vaccines have not proven to do uh, anything to really aid people that are between ages of six months and five years old, that the odds of any real, real, any risk happening from COVID to age groups in that, that realm, almost nil, and that there are definite and provable risks of periocarditis, myocarditis, et cetera, coming from vaccinations. Now I'm going to talk about something else coming up too. We'll see if that gets me pulled off YouTube. But when you have a 15 to zero vote enraging I'd say more than half the country, because as of right now, something like only 8% of children between six, uh, six, six, six months old and five years old, I think I'm getting that right, have been vaccinated, right? That's an astronomically low number. And let's not forget, by the way, that the number of Americans that have received, that are eligible to receive the new COVID booster is about 1.5% which is great news because it means people are waking up. They're not buying the, the propaganda anymore. And they realize that the risk reward of this is simply not there. So you have parents that have the option to vaccinate their children against the COVID-19 virus with these mRNA vaccines. Only 8% of parents decided to take that plunge. That means 90% plus of parents don't think it's worth it, don't think it's a good idea, simply aren't willing to risk their children's health on something like this. Yet, the CDC votes 15 to 0 to add it to the vaccine schedule. Now, is the vaccine schedule for children mandatory? No. Do states make it mandatory to go to public school by adopting the quote-unquote recommendations? Yes. Yes, they do. And even though you'll see Democrats saying, oh, well, this isn't what it means, and fact-checkers, oh, that's not what it means. Well, when it does happen in your state, and when you're in a state like California, as I am, with an asshole like Gavin Newsom running it, well, you really have to wonder if that's going to trickle down, if the state's going to say, well, yes, all of our children in our public schools, K-12, through have to use this vaccine schedule. Or if they'll give some leeway and say, no, you don't have to do that, or no, we're not going to require that. I would certainly hope it's the second, and I would hope that parents far and wide are lining up, and they're making this the number one campaign issue, other than possibly inflation or nuclear war, going into the midterms. Because this is really, I mean, you talk about, as I said in the head headline of this, you talk about candidates being lined up on death row. We saw in Virginia what happens when you get parents on your bad side. Right? That Virginia election pretty much flipped the instant that was it McAuliffe said that education should not be in any way, shape, or form under the guise of parents. That you don't have a right to know your child's curriculum. Parents were like, nope, absolutely not. Get the fuck out of here. You're going to see the same thing here. And good luck to any Democrat that's out there campaigning that has a record of saying that people should have to be vaccinated to go out in public, that has a record of saying that children should be vaccinated, that has a record of working with teachers' unions to vaccinate and make sure there's things. Good luck. I mean, it is going to be an absolute blow. It was, it was already looking bad. It was already looking bad. And you're seeing polls come out where in New York, 
right? A ultra blue state, New York, there is a legitimate shot a Republican governor could take over. In what was the other one I was reading about recently? In uh, not not in, uh, Massachusetts, Oregon. In Oregon, they've got a neck and neck race where a Republican could be running Oregon. Now, Oregon, of course, has gone crazy left to the point where this is why it's flipping back. The madness, the insanity, the Antifa protests, these homelessness problems have taken over so severely that this has flipped countries, not flipped, this has flipped states and flipped counties to red. And on top of it now, you have the CDC saying, well, guess what? You just might have to inoculate your kid if you want to keep him going to public school. Now, for me, that's a red line in the sand, right? My wife and I, I'm combining metaphors there, whatever. My wife and I are not going to be inoculating our child with a COVID-19 vaccine. I don't give a shit. I don't, we'll figure something else out. I absolutely will not comply. I will not inject her with anything that is this experimental. I'm actually un, I'm actually not really happy with the number of vaccines that are currently on the schedule that is that are required in California. It's something like we used to get 10 vaccines and it was against polio and measles, you know, the, the bad things, typhoid, tuberculosis, you know, whatever else your Tdaps, you get eight to 10 against the real bad stuff. And right now the schedule's got something like 40 plus, maybe, maybe even more. That just doesn't seem like a great idea in general, does it? But at least all of those have gone through a thorough vetting process, unlike the most recent vaccines, which of course we know were fast, pa fast paced through. We know that these were used under the emergency um, act or the, what do they call it? The uh, emergency usage. So for the CDC to ignore thousands of comments, to ignore public sentiment, the point of 92% of parents saying no, and to recommend this is a sickness. It's, a, it's an abuse of power. And it showcases how the CDC certainly seems to be just another arm of big pharma. They're basically a propaganda arm for big pharma, just like mainstream media is a propaganda arm for the empire. I think it's gonna come out to be one of the most defining issues of probably 10 years. That's my guess. And it couldn't have happened at a worse time for Democrats. There's no way they can defend it. And there's just no way. Unless you're a Democrat loudly proclaiming that no one should have to be vaccinated, your body, your choice, right? There's no way these people are going to survive it and get through. Okay, now tying into this, there's a new, uh, new study that came out and this is from, uh, let me see, hold on, let me scroll down here. Okay, a new study has come out and it shows, uh, this is a new study out of Switzerland and it's talking about how a, the, all these people that have gotten boosters and this is uh, from a video from Vinay Prasad, MD. He's talking about this new study wherein these elevated levels of troponin are being sensed in every single person that has the vaccine. Or actually, I shouldn't say every single, but a, the vast majority of people have this higher level of troponin. Now, troponin isn't normally found in the blood. It's a type of protein. I'm reading directly from this. It's a type of protein found in the muscles of your heart. Troponin isn't normally found in the blood. When heart muscles become damaged, troponin is sent into the bloodstream. As heart damage increases, greater amounts of troponin are released into the blood. So what this study is showing is that there is a massive amount of troponin comparatively in a, a vast population amount of the, of the bloodstream, right? So everybody more or less is getting a little bit of heart damage from these vaccines. And that is something where you go, okay, Let's extend this, right? I got one dose of the vaccine, or I guess two, right? I, I got Pfizer, had to get it to go over to Austria to do the Austrian Economics Conference. Again, my risk reward, my choice. Nobody forced me to do it, but it was something I had to do to go to Austria. The country required it. So I had two, two shots. As I've said many times on this show, I had heart issues. They are now gone. I haven't had a heart issue um, to the point I had a, probably a month now, right? Because I work out almost every day. I walk my dogs for about three to four miles every day. Then I'll go to the gym and I'll work out and do harder cardio and do weightlifting and all that kind of stuff. And I also did you know, some hardcore kind of MMA boxing stuff I do every Friday morning. I would get walking the dogs, my heart skipping beats. 
I would get going to the gym. If I, as soon as I got off the elliptical, if I was just at a steady pace, I'd be okay. As soon as I got off, heart skipping beats, trying to slow down. Boom, 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 boom. Terrifying. If I'm doing my hardcore MMA, doing the boxing, doing the push-ups, whatever, stop. Thump, 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 thump. Terrifying, right? Now, maybe you'd say, Brian, well, you should have stopped working out with that happening. Why? I, I, you know, why? I'm going to push through, which I did. It's now gone away. But I haven't had a booster. Not one. I never will get a booster for the rest of my life. Haven't had a booster. So my troponin levels probably have dropped down to normal. I have, you know, my, the damage to my heart muscles has now rescinded. It's, re it's receded, I should say. So all these people are getting boosters. Are they just adding stress and stress and stress? Are we going to see higher and higher and higher troponin levels in their blood? Because every time you get a booster, you're adding stress to your heart muscles. You're doing damage to it. We see the results, results of myocarditis. We see the results of periocarditis. We see all these athletes that are keeling over. We see these, the, the dangers to people that are under 40 and their males. You see all these people ending up in the hospitals. You see that so many people that have gotten boosted up are ending up DED. <laughs> You know, it's like, I go on and I'm like, I'm going to try not to get banned off YouTube. Ugh, I know, I know it's going to get pulled down. I know it's going to get pulled down. And this study was from Professor Christian Mueller, um, who has a well-respected, well-authored uh, professor, uh, many publications on cardiac injury in scientific literature. So the hope here is that the study that just was released is not going to come under massive attack because this is a guy who was completely respected within the industry completely respected. There's no way you can say that he is a conspiracy theory. There's no way you can say he's a quack. This is a guy who's been around, who's done it, who's written on cardiac issues throughout his career, now putting out this publication. And you're seeing more people get brave about this because I think it's, number one, some people are finally getting the backbone to support what's supposed to be the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, right? CDC didn't seem to remember that, but some of these doctors are finally coming around. And also, I think that's just that the facts are simply incontrovertible at this point. The evidence is too stark and too bare. But the other thing to remember, too, and I talked about this with John a little bit on our on our show we did, the meme wars. You know, Fabian Liberty uh, made a great point. Follow him on Twitter. But, you know, Fabian Liberty made a great point that this also, putting this vaccine on the schedule, right, frees up lawsuits down the road, again, why you can argue the CDC is simply a propaganda arm and a, a shield for big pharma. But if the vaccines are on the schedule, legally, they are immune from lawsuits. Any vaccine that's on the vaccine schedule is immune from lawsuits. That's why you never hear about any of these people suing over, you know, over getting the inoculations of, you know, X, Y, and Z. It's why you don't have uh, pharmaceutical companies liable because the government decided we want to have our population inoculated. We know there are going to be some adverse effects, right? Through the, the, uh, vaccine, uh, VAERS, vaccine, blah, 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 reporting system. I can't remember exactly what the, the thing stands for. V A E R S I believe, but it's where people report adverse effects, vaccine, adverse events, reporting system. Yeah. They were saying that, oh, these events being reported from the COVID vaccine aren't true, but now we're seeing they are uh, absolutely true. We're seeing that there was underreporting in many cases, but these, are, you know, every vaccine has these reports. The government wanted to make sure that people could not sue pharma companies because they viewed it as so important to have a vaccinated population that they wanted to make sure there wasn't a legal ramification to scare big pharma off from creating vaccines. So now you have the CDC giving complete COVID protection to the vaccine manufacturers. Uh, it was supposed to be a 10 year window, I think. Now, I guess it's basically forever. So there you have it. Okay. Uh, last thing, guys, to wrap the show up today. You may have heard about the uh, idiots from, I think it was like uh, Get Off Big Oil or something like that, who threw tomato soup on a Van Gogh. Now, the Van Gogh thing, I talked about this on the show. The Van Gogh thing, fine. As a one-off, I get. You're throwing soup on the canvas. You want to make the point, well, we're taking, you know, taking so much pride in protecting these works of art, right? We're preserving this Van Gogh. We should try to preserve our own culture, our own people against the ravages of oil on our ecosystem, right? As a messaging standpoint, fine, I get it. 
I gave him, I said, yeah, kudos. You get, you get one, right? You get one. You made your point. You got all this publicity. Great. Well, now there's a different shit bag group that's out here that threw uh, mashed potatoes on a Monet. Now, this is from a group called Last Generation. I guess it's some German group of uh, naturally uh, very wealthy white women. It's always the well, it's always the well-off white imbeciles that tend to do these things, by the way, that are going to very expensive colleges that have liberal arts degrees that always tend to do this stuff. Like those assholes that glued themselves to the floor of the Volkswagen plant, the Volkswagen showroom. They glued themselves to the floor. That's the new hot thing, gluing your hands to the floor. Then they had to poop. <laughs> and Volkswagen said, well, we support what you're trying to do, but we're not going to bring you buckets to crap in. <laughs> Which, honestly, good job, Volkswagen. That's called getting your cake and eating it too, right? Because they can pretend that they are all for the cause. And maybe they are. I don't know. Maybe they're for the cause. Maybe they're not for the cause. Volkswagen, I think, was not for the cause because they were notably uh, sued by the European Union for misreporting, and they said intentionally misreporting emissions outputs on their vehicles. So I, me thinks they aren't too much into the cause. But saying, look, yeah, we support your right to protest. Come on. And then not giving them the buckets? Hilarious. Because then what are you just going to sit there and crap your pants for the next 24 hours? Go for it, guys. Protest it up. We're going to lock the doors. You enjoy sitting in your crepulence. You can stare at each other, your dirty, unwashed, hippie bodies, and a little, a little extra layer of feces on your butts there. Make it worth our while. Well done, Volkswagen. But these idiots now come in and throw mashed potatoes on Monet. Now, the thing about this is, you get one, right? It's like the old Spider-Man joke on a family guy. Everybody gets one save with Spider-Man. That first group that did it, okay, an interesting little twist. As I said, the messaging, okay, I can understand the resonation of the messaging. You got you, you ruined one work of art, they're going to repair it, but you made your point. These unoriginal bastards coming in, throwing mashed potatoes on a Monet. It's going to be a whole buffet, by the way. No, home country buffet should be where we have all our, all our art pieces, right? The museum should just be in the home country buffet. And that way people can go up to the buffet, they can fill themselves with the slop, and then they can throw whatever they want on masterpieces. We can put all the goobers in one place. We can put, you know, put some some plastic. It'd be like a theme park thing. You know, you pay like $20 entry and we'll put some plastic on the, the things and they can throw mashed potatoes and somebody can throw liver and onions and the guy can flick peas at it. It'll be fun for the whole eco-friendly family. The whole climate nutbag family. Greta Thunberg can come in there and she can be ladling out, you know, hot gravy. It'd be great. Thunberg's uh, thunderous chicken thighs special today. But these unoriginal pricks go in and ruin now a Monet. And I'm sure it's going to be harder to clean off mashed potato than it is soup because the mashed potato is a little bit thicker, probably gets in the nooks and crannies of the painting. Whatever. Point being, they'll still, cre they'll still recreate it. They'll still get it back to where it's supposed to be. But these dickheads now are turning people against the cause. It's kind of like these climate protesters that get, man, you know, they, they stop trains from going or they block freeways. Look, a, a freeway's never been blocked that won anybody to your side. In the history of the world, inconveniencing people is not the way to get see people on your side. You might get headlines, but more often than not, you're going to get people more angry at you and what you're doing and the way you're doing it than they are to support it. Like these idiots that are pouring milk cartons out in the grocery store, flying kick to the head if I see that happen in a grocery store. Flying kick to the head. Doesn't make me want to support your cause, but cow flatulence or anything like that. Just makes me hate you. This shit now has crossed the Rubicon from, okay, novel concept, well executed, bravo, now go away, go think of something else to do, into severe annoyance to anybody that's an art that's an art lover, to anybody that is just a, a decent human being, that these copycats are now going to try to do this to every different work of art. It's obnoxious. It's not a way to convince people. It's not, I'd say, it's not good branding. It's going to drive people away from the cause. And it's going to make them roll their eyes and just get pissed off. So epic fail. All right, guys, that's going to do it from me, from the Lions of Liberty Network and from Mean Age Daydream. Again, please share the show, subscribe, join the Patreon and support the show in any way you can. Don't be a jerk to quote Peter Venkman on Ghostbusters. All right, that's it. I will uh, check you later, so keep those electric eyes on me, babe, and keep 
that ray gun to my head.